Also, uh, I want to mention that last week we had a longer interview format. It was a great show, but this week we're kind of going back to our normal format, which is three parts, inspiration, information, and interaction. Inspiration are things that are uplifting, that help us, to inspire us. Information is practical ideas of how we can make the world better, how we can make our lives better. And finally, interaction, which may happen all through the program, but especially at the end, we'll have time for Q&A, discussion, that kind of thing. So. Anyway, to get us started today, our, this week, was, I was going to say a guest, but really Jeff isn't a guest, because uh, Jeff is one of the founding ministers of the Objective Church. But I wanted Jeff is particularly to speak today to be a part of this program, because Jeff is, is a veteran, and we just had Veterans Day. And in America, Veterans Day, in many ways, is used sometimes to honor people who have been in the military, but more often it's been used as an excuse, a justification for militarism as a time to celebrate military. And so I wanted today to have on someone to speak who is a veteran, who has been in the military, but who chose a different path. And to talk about that, share about his story, and also to share a little bit about the history of Courage to Resist. Uh, Courage to Resist is the organization that's been around now for I think 12 years or so, but is one of our primary areas of work with the Objector Church. And so I wanted him to share a little bit about that. So. A um, lot more I could tell about Jeff. He's a really good guy. I've been a friend of his for many years. But uh, with, without further ado, I want to kind of jump into the conversation a little bit. First of all, just ask you, where did you grow up and why did you join the military in the first place? I think that's a, a complicated question. And mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of people have many different reasons uh, to join the military. For me, it came down to, it was part of where I grew up. I grew up in the Central Valley of California. I felt like there had to be something more uh, than this small uh, farming town that felt like uh, the middle of nowhere <laughs> at the time. And also I felt like I didn't really fit in uh, to the, the cowboy and, the, and that kind of culture. Um, mm -hmm. And my family, you know, I thought we were middle class because everybody thinks they're middle class in America today uh, for the most part. But we were uh, we were pretty pretty broke, <laughs> and uh, you know there was there was no resources. Uh, you know my uh, my mom was single. We we're barely making ends meet. Uh, she worked her butt off at a defense factory in town, which is probably one of the biggest employers uh, aside from agriculture. And you know when I graduated from high school, it felt like I couldn't, you know, I was looking for jobs. I was trying to sign up for the community college that was like 15 miles away and there was no real buses and we only had one car and my mom had to take it to work and, mm -hmm. and trying to figure all that out was daunting. And here sure. was my, my buddy joined the Marine Corps. Um, and he's like, you know, come on down to the recruiting station on the, you know, the big town over in Salinas uh, in California and uh, free hot dogs and soda. And I'm <laughs> like, all right, free food. Uh, I never yeah. passed that up. And the military recruiter, you know, asked me what my plan was for my life. And I'm like, well, it's, it's tough. I started telling him my problems and he's like, well, I, I can solve all those problems. I got I got an answer for you. And, you know, I don't, and it just, it just seems so much easier. It just seems so much easier to uh, do that. And all of a sudden have uh, this uh, automatic uh, respect, I guess, that uh, sure. people are like, oh yeah, that, that kid, he did something. He, he does, mm -hmm. he's not the guy that's working at Burger King or something. Mm -hmm. Not that there's anything wrong with that, <laughs> but uh, that's what I was thinking. And mm -hmm. I also had no reason to question uh, the the narrative of the U.S. military as a protector of peace and freedom around the world, and and all that stuff. So it it seemed like it seemed like if I if I joined the military and especially the Marine Corps. Um, if I had to, I knew I'd be trained to kill people, but I 
never thought for a second that I wouldn't be killing, I, I, I assumed I'd be killing good people or I mean bad people. Mm -hmm. we, were the, we were the good guys. Sure. We would go elsewhere and we would kill bad guys if needed. Mm -hmm. And I had no problem uh, with that <laughs> mm -hmm. in that, um, you know, they're bad guys uh, and uh, that's what would happen. Also, this was uh, 1986 and we were um, in a standoff with the Soviet Union at the time. Mm -hmm. And I also thought that a, a nuclear holocaust would be coming sooner than later. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very nihilistic in that, well, I'd, I'd rather be on the front lines of the end of the world versus mm -hmm. the versus just suffering through a nuclear winter that would last for uh, years and years, uh, you know, walking dead style kind of thing. Sure. So I thought, sure. I, I thought, you know, it, it, if we're going to all die, I might as well, you know, play a, be an active participant in the, in the, in the end of the world. Sure. Um, and that's, you know, and you're, I mean, I'm 18 years old. Uh, so I, it's not like I gave a whole lot of thought of it to it, but war and peace, that was kind of how it broke down for me. Mm -hmm. um, now, where all were you stationed? Yeah. Well, I, let's see, well, uh, basic training in San Diego. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my first, you know, it was my first airplane ride. Uh, my first airplane ride was the basic training. Uh, and I was then stationed in Lawton, Oklahoma, not, not too far from where you are now, James. Yeah, spend uh, a fair bit of time visiting there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where I did uh, artillery training uh, mm -hmm. in Lawton. Then straight away to uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, Okinawa, Okinawa, mm -hmm. Japan. Um, and I was there for a total of almost two years in Okinawa. And from there, we did floats uh, to uh, the Philippines, Subic Bay. Uh, but we spent a good amount of time in uh, Incheon Valley in uh, South Korea, uh, just mm -hmm. a few miles south of the, the DMZ. And there mm -hmm. we did a, a yearly uh, huge military operation, back then called Operation Bear Hunt. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I got to go to the, the DMZ, North Koreans and and stare down the North Korean soldier and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so, you know, and, and finally, the, I did four years active duty, and the last year I got to spend some time in, in uh, Hawaii. Uh, so I, I really enjoyed Hawaii after, after all those other places. Sure. So what changed your career path, uh, to put it in a more gentle way? <laughs> Well, you know, I think the, the day of boot camp, the first day of boot camp, I had a second thought. It's like, what? Sure. Is this really what I wanted to do? Guys are yelling at me and calling me worthless. And, you know, and I, they were telling me how important I was at the recruiting center. And now I'm a maggot uh, <laughs> <laughs> and all this stuff. Uh, but... You know, I thought that after boot camp, it would just, you know, it would get better. You know, I would mm -hmm. get to the, the fleet, you know, where the real Marines are. And, and uh, but yet, uh, they still treated you like dirt on the fleet. Um, so that, you know, all those annoying things that I probably at least 50% of my fellow Marines were thinking the same thing. Sure. Um, but during my, during those years in their late 80s, uh, there was a lot of, uh, I was, you know, we all watched Oliver North in our, in my, uh, in artillery shop, you know, give testimony uh, before Congress uh, about arming uh, uh, mercenary death squads in South and Central America. And we all debated those uh, questions. And around that time, uh, we were doing more and more training uh that was clearly focused on, uh, in, well, we call it uh, saving Central America from communists, mm -hmm. but basically uh, shoring up uh, the governments down there. There was the, the, the Sandinista revolution was still going on, Nicaragua. Uh, the FMLN was making headlines uh, with their civil war in El Salvador. And it was a lot of, you know, we got to go down there. We got to kill them. We got to kill the communists, uh, save the poor farmers and, 
And as I was fully expecting to deploy to save, uh, you know, people from communism, I started reading more and more uh, about that. And there was like church people that were uh, publishing uh, op-eds in the newspapers and uh, stuff like that in Hawaii, where I was hanging around the University of Hawaii there. And I, I really, I, basically I came to the conclusion that uh, the people in Central America did not need uh, our, us to butt in, that uh, they should sure. figure, figure out the, what's going on all by themselves. Um, and I really felt that uh, it was wrong uh, for the United States to uh, be, uh, I guess, uh, intervening in their, in their affairs. Now, of course, in hindsight, you know, we've done that for hundreds of years, uh, but mm -hmm. I didn't really know that at the time. Yeah. <laughs> So that's the political thing of like, you know, we're, we're not always killing the good guys. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the bad guys. <laughs> and we're not always the good guys. And I sort of learned that in Korea and, and the Philippines where, you know, people didn't exactly, you know, run out to welcome us with open arms. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, at that point I was like, I just, I got, you know, I have X number of months left in my contract. I'm, you know, I'm going to keep my head down. Hopefully sure. I'm not, I'm not going to have to go uh, get shot at in Central America by communists and I'll just get out and go to college and live happily ever after. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was my plan. And I was, a, uh, I don't know, I was about three weeks, four weeks short of uh, my uh, uh, end of active duty. Wow. Uh, time uh iraq invaded kuwait um around august 1st or august 2nd in 1990 and all of a sudden uh everybody is not getting out as as scheduled everybody's in until the end of the war um at first i started packing my bags and i had a lot of reservations i didn't feel like i had come to the conclusion that u.s intervention in central america was wrong I hadn't thought too much about the Middle East uh, at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, although, you know, people I worked with had uh, done some UN peacekeeping stuff over there. And a lot of people knew pe some other people that were killed in the Beirut bombing. Uh, like none of my friends, but I knew friends that knew people. Um, and it seemed like a mess. And mm -hmm. It is those are those are the things that got me thinking, and but it was still like thinking about things and being disgruntled as sure. as most of us were. Um, my training, as I mentioned, was with artillery, uh, but along the way uh, they sent me to um, a very spe a more specialized school for uh, uh, battlefield tactical uh, nuclear uh, warheads uh, for. Yeah. 198 millimeter howitzers. So, and it turned out that like I was one of the only two guys in the battalion that had that certification with what we called the silver bullet, which was the, the battlefield uh, cannon fired uh, small nuclear warheads. Uh, so during our battalion muster gearing up for uh, Desert Shield, they were calling it, uh, the commander literally is like, well, if anything goes wrong over there, Corporal Patterson, everybody looks at me, he's going to, he's going to set the silver bullet. And we're going to nuke them all. And he, you know, wow. He, in verbatim, he said, we're going to nuke all the ragheads. Um, and then I am at that moment, I'm like shocked. Like somebody punched me in the face basically. And I'm surrounded by hundreds uh, it seemed like hundreds, but dozens of Marines dancing up and down, shouting, nuke the ragheads, nuke the ragheads, nuke the ragheads. Um, and this being egged on by our commander. Um, and I, I think I might have like started like, you know, a tear or something because, uh, you know, the staff sergeant next to me is like, hey, are you okay, dude? And he's like, because he didn't understand why I wasn't as excited as everybody else was at that time. Um, and that was probably what pushed me over the edge. Mm -hmm. um, I realized, you know, I, I thought about that. I 
just kept packing my bags, but I just thought well, maybe, you know, if they order me to, to, to set the timer, I'll intentionally uh, mess it up. Like I'll intentionally set it so it doesn't go off. Uh, I started mm -hmm. thinking of things like that. Um, or, you know, some other kind of way to sabotage mm -hmm. <laughs> a, a nuclear holocaust. Um, wow. So you know that's that was my plan. I guess I would just I would just be a I would just turn to sabotage. Mm -hmm. um, There's a long history of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought some more, but then I realized if I'm not willing to like nu drop a nuclear bomb on people, you know, what will I do if I'm on the the you know if I'm on the line, looking out over the battlefield, and I you know with my uh, you know, 50 caliber machine gun, you know, would I be okay just shooting people from a mile away with my machine gun and, and all that kind of thing. And I realized I, I wasn't comfortable with that either. And then yeah. I'm like, well, maybe I'll just shoot over their heads or something. Mm -hmm. Um, and all this kind of thing. I finally realized, well, if I'm not willing to drop a nuclear bomb on people, I'm not even willing to shoot people. Maybe I shouldn't be going, uh, to war with these other people that were very, seemed very excited about doing all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, I, not to make a long story too long, but I, I decided that I just wasn't, uh, I was somehow, I was gonna speak out against the war. I would, I would uh, not participate in some way. Uh, I would be go, I would go to jail instead or something. I didn't know what was gonna happen, mm -hmm. um, but uh, that's why I decided. Um, I had some friends at the University of Hawaii. They took me to an attorney. Um, the the basically a couple of days before I was supposed to deploy, I told him I wasn't going to fight. Um, he told me he asked me if I was a conscientious objector. Uh, I had I had no idea uh, what that uh, meant, what that what those words meant. Mm -hmm. Um. When, when I joined the military a years prior during the interrogation or whatever, they, there was three big questions you had to say no to. Uh, one was uh, if you're a homosexual, um, you had to say no. And the other is if you were a communist, you had to say no to that. And, and the third was, are you a conscience objector? And I, you know, the, the recruiter just said, well, you just have to say no to that. Uh, so I did. And that's the last time I heard about it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so this attorney told me about conscience rejection. And I don't know. As I felt like maybe I, maybe I was, maybe I wasn't. But I filed. You know, I wrote, I stayed up that night, uh, uh, wrote my application. Uh, mm -hmm. The next day, I did a press conference with that attorney downtown Honolulu. I then went to the military and handed in my application um and they yelled at me a lot <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh so yeah so they they threatened to uh court martial me for many different things uh, they decided uh, not to they decided they would just take me to iraq instead and punish me in the desert somehow um <laughs> I didn't want to go to Iraq, but I yeah. felt like they would, they didn't really care what I thought. Um, mm -hmm. So I stopped eating, I went on a hunger strike. The idea was to like disable myself in case I did find myself in Iraq. I, I, find, I, I literally couldn't uh, participate physically regardless. Mm -hmm. um, so I did that. And uh, so a week later, uh, the, they, they, uh, put me, uh, you know, they put a bunch of bodyguards around me and they, they walked me out to a, a plane on the tarmac of uh, the Kaneohe uh, Marine Corps Air Station, Honolulu, or the other side of the, of the island from Honolulu. Mm -hmm. um, and the bodyguards, you know, I knew all these guys for years. Uh, yeah. It wasn't like they were strangers. So it was, sure. they were, uh, they were conflicted. Uh, because sure. the command was saying that uh, I should be I should be beaten up, uh, but but don't do it. But if you did do it, it would be understandable. I think that was the speech 
<laughs> during one of the formations <laughs> I was in and uh, stuff like that. So very uh, contradictory messaging. Mm -hmm. But because I knew these guys for years, I was, I was relatively safe um, sure. in that regard. But you know, they were being ordered to take me onto the plane and they knew they didn't feel that that was right. Um, and because at that point I was a medical issue, uh, cause I had lost a lot of weight and uh, I was still having to like run five, six miles a day and all that stuff without eating for a week. But, um, so I was, it was a big question. Do I, do they drag me onto the plane or do they leave me behind? And at the end of the day, they, they all got on the plane and, and they left me uh, behind there. And not before they yelled at me, they, they threatened to uh, murder uh, my family. If I didn't get on the plane, they, they threatened to come back and murder me uh, when they got back from Iraq, if I didn't get on the plane, um, things like that, uh, not nice things. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, if I, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to get up and go with them uh, based yeah. on that because it, it seemed like it would be easier to murder me there than here kind of deal. Sure, sure. <laughs> but it was very much an out of body experience. It was, you know, it'll probably be the most interesting, uh, you know, few hours of my life. Uh, mm -hmm. Very much condensed situation. But uh, yeah, so that sort of changed my life, I guess. Uh, they then, they took me to the Pearl Harbor Brig. Uh, there was a court martial about a month, uh, a few months later, and the court martial was happening right before the war was going to start, uh, and they basically decided to throw me out. Uh, in the middle of the court martial, they offered me a deal that I could walk away with, away from, and um, mm -hmm. I took the deal, and I was out of the military a few hours later. Wow. Um, so you just so, get the OTH? I did. I have an other than honorable discharge, uh, <laughs> United States Marine Corps. Um, so yeah, and I was a corporal, and and now I have to be a, a lance corporal for the rest of my life. In my, uh, <laughs> yeah. my former uh, designation. So I don't well, know. There's so much detail. I'd love to ask more. We would maybe do this <laughs> for another time because there's just this is such a fascinating story. Particularly we really is very little has been told about the stories of resistors in the first Gulf War. But I wanted us to transition a little bit to talking about how and why you founded Courage to Resist. I, I assume a lot of it had to be just your experiences as a resistor may have had a part of that, but could you share a little bit about that part of it? Well, uh, you know, one of the first things I did when I got out of jail in 1991, um, was tried to start an organization for military war resistors to the Gulf War. Mm -hmm. We had uh, over 100 of us, maybe closer to 150 of us were jailed for refusing to fight that war. Really? Wow. I, I published a, a I, I published four issues of a newsletter called The Anti-Warrior. Um, mm -hmm. I traveled around the country. Um, uh, you know, trying to tell the stories and advocating uh, for the release. There was uh, almost two dozen Marines that were being held in mass at Camp Lejeune for refusing to fight in, in Iraq. Um, almost half of them were from a single unit upstate New York. Um, but, you know, the war finished very quickly. Uh, and the U.S. got out for the most part. Um, so there really wasn't a basis uh, to, to do much more. Uh, at that point so you know I went off and uh, I was I, I moved to San Francisco became an activist did activist -y stuff uh, throughout the 90s uh, after 9-11 I helped start uh, a national uh, anti-war group called not in our name mm -hmm. um, and when Not In Our Name was sort of ending around 2005 some of the first uh, uh, Iraq war resistors, uh, post 9-11 Iraq war resistors were stepping forward. Uh, Stephen Funk here in the Bay Area might have been the first uh, military person to publicly refuse the Iraq war. So I worked with this family to do support here. A few months later, uh, Staff Sergeants uh, Kevin Benjamin 
and uh, Camilo Mejia were for facing court martial on the same day in different parts of the country. Uh, Navy uh, Petty Officer Pablo Paredes in San Diego uh, was facing a court martial that I attended around that same period. Mm -hmm. So it seemed like um, instead of try, trying to help these individuals uh, one by one, uh, and there was an interested community, especially here in the Bay Area, that we would uh, create a, a standing organization that would support uh, these people and future people. Um, mm -hmm. And that's how Courage Jesus came about. Uh, I, I wasn't particularly excited about starting a, a new organization, but uh, my friend uh, uh, David Solnit, uh, a great uh, activist here in the Bay Area, uh, if you don't know David, you might know his sister, uh, Rebecca Solnit, which uh, is a fantastic feminist, uh, prolific author. Um, you know, she did uh, uh, men explain things to me, and she uh, uh, she coined the term uh, mansplaining. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's that's how Courage Jesus uh, came about, and uh, since then, uh, we've worked with uh, hundreds of military service people facing uh, it, crises of conscience in some way, uh, war resistors, conscientious objectors, um, and of course, uh, <laughs> attorney uh, James Branham has worked on many of those cases as well. So uh, when you take off your uh, minister hat, James, uh, I'd like to thank you for those. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there is, and again, there's a lot. We, we may have some future uh, meetups where we're going to talk more about Courage to Resist history and its current work. There's so much to tell, but since we're running out of time, we're going to go a few minutes late, but we're trying to not to make, go too far over. Um, I do want to invite those who are watching. It looks like right now, I'm not seeing any folks on Zoom. We do have a few folks on Facebook. I especially want to welcome Cheryl and Serena. Y'all have been some most faithful folks watching our previous meetups, but if there's others out there, uh, feel free to post a comment, uh, or if you have questions for Jeff or myself, we're, we'd love to hear them. But that's on the Facebook page for Objector Church. You can find a Facebook Live running now. For the future, though, I want to mention as far as Zoom, why we're moving to Zoom is just it allows us to have conversations with two of us or more, or more than two people. And so we're really excited about this as a possibility and uh, love feedback. If any of you do want to try logging in through Zoom, Informations on that is on the tell us about how to do that on Facebook, but also on our website. So, uh, hoping against the folks who join us there as well, because it's a really, really neat, neat platform. Um, so now we're kind of a place now transitioning a little bit to the next part of our meetup, and that is to talk talk about. Oh, there's a a fantastic picture there, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> basic training at Camp Pendleton, 1986. Wow. Yeah. Let's see, yeah, uh, that's uh, Korea there. It's my uh, saw automated machine gun. And uh, that's me actually sitting down on the runway as people are trying to drag me onto the plane. Wow, how old were you there? I think I was almost 20, I was 21, I would think. Yeah. Almost 22. And uh, they're, they're, they're threatening to, uh, well, they're threatening all kinds of different heinous things but they're probably threatening to murder me at some point um so i decided to just sort of sit there instead and that was my plan that's amazing that's <laughs> amazing this was the evidence that they, they were going to use well they did use in my court martial to convict me uh so the but you know i actually i really do appreciate the military photographer taking time to, to document the <laughs> They they, the they, 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 your time. <laughs> they 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 I think they decide never to do anything like that again though. <laughs> yeah, no, it's interesting. I've dealt with a lot of cases, similar showdowns before deployments, and now generally they they avoid this at all costs. Uh, right. fact, I don't know of anyone who's had this level of a showdown on the tarmac. It usually. <laughs> In fact, one of my clients, his big showdown was just he didn't deliver the medical records to the to the people for his. Uh, he, he just sat down by a tree and said, "No, I'm not taking my medical records." Now. This is <laughs> one of the steps towards uh, being deployed, and that was all they needed. Yeah, and the, here's a, a newsletter. You know, I did uh, after I got out called the Anti Warrior, and these were the Marines 
uh, being held at Camp Lejeune. Uh, all those were objectors awaiting a military trial. Uh, you can wow. sort of see that below the graphic there. Yeah, are those newsletters, are they available online anywhere? Yeah, well, I don't know. I had a website. Not, you need to put them on archive or something. Yeah. That's, that's some pretty amazing history there. Uh, here cool. you see I'm delighted to be graduating boot camp right there. Happy <laughs> beyond belief. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, my, me and my family there to San Diego. Wow. And uh, yeah. And again, that's the, the, the naval investigator also making some kind of threats. He's pointing to the plane. And he was uh, telling me that uh, there was even uh, women Marines on that plane uh, <laughs> and that uh, they had larger testicles uh, than I did. So uh, wow! all I remember is him shouting at me how the women on the plane had bigger balls than me. <laughs> <laughs> he said that many times. <laughs> oh, wow. That's a hoot and a holler. <laughs> Wow, those pictures are something. Mm -hmm. All well, right. Oh, go you, ahead. You, well, you can get on with your sermon now, James. Okay, that's all right. Now, please just share more pictures <laughs> if we're going. I'll, I'll talk a little bit so we're not too far out of time, but please keep showing pictures. I'm loving it. <laughs> it's kind of like this really awesome family slideshow, but much more fun <laughs> than a normal family slideshow. Well, and these are some of, the, some of the people that were imprisoned around the same time. Uh, the two guys at the ends uh, were army objectors. Uh, Eric Larson is a uh, center left and I'm center right. And we were just at a protest. We were trying to like figure out what, if we could start an organization uh, to support other resistors and what would be that, what would that be like? Uh, part of it, there just wasn't enough of us and mm -hmm. all four of us had hugely different opinions on what kind of organization it should be. Mm -hmm. uh, like some of us were very patriotic, wanted to embrace the flag. Uh, I wanted to, I want nothing to do with the flag mm -hmm. <laughs> personally. Um, so it's just, there wasn't enough of us to, to gel around a, a particular thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And here I went back to Hawaii for the first time. And these were some of the resistors that were still in jail at the time so uh, that was probably me uh, running around Waikiki with leaflets trying to talk to uh, active duty uh, army people down downtown while they're trying to party and get drunk um, mm. <laughs> so yeah that's that's all I'm gonna uh, uh, inflict upon you for now oh I'm enjoying it and now this <laughs> history is it's something that again I you know my I mean, again, back in those days, I was a uh, very pro-war high schooler, and my perception, I just, because of that, even though I was alive at the time, I knew nothing about this resistance. It wasn't something that was all getting mainstream media attention, at least in Oklahoma. Um, and so it was so, so far off our radar screen. And uh, in the more current era, again, that's, I had a very different orientation, so I was looking for it. But even then, I think today, there's some people I talk to who are completely unaware of resistance in the current era, to say nothing previous eras. And so I think, I think telling this history is super, super, super important. Oh, thanks, James. And yeah, when I was in high school, you know, it was uh, the mid 80s. And of course, there was all kinds of things going on in the mid 80s, but uh, none of it got to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so I definitely... Well, what's so interesting is in hindsight now, in being involved in peace work the last, oh, Oh, 15, eight, 17, 18 years or so, I've learned that there is a hotbed of activity in Oklahoma in the 70s and 80s. A major part of the, the, the movement of helping asylum seekers in Central America make it to Canada was through Oklahoma, a huge part of this underground railroad. But again, I was completely oblivious to it. Uh, many people I now know here are friends with today or were key parts of that movement. So it's right. It's, it's kind of fascinating how things in history can be happening right around us. We know nothing about it. So, well, I do want to mention on the information part of our program, I do want to mention a couple things. First of all, for those of you in Oklahoma, I want to mention that we're planning some kind of alternative Thanksgiving potluck in Oklahoma City 
on Saturday, November 24th. We don't have a venue yet, we're working on that. Uh, the few possibilities, trying to find something that's free uh, so that we don't pay any money to use it. So if you have any ideas, shoot me an email, james at, sorry, j uh, james at objector.church. But we will be doing something probably in the afternoon, Saturday, November 24th, just an alternative gathering for one, for folks that don't have folks they want as family to, to connect with over the, the holiday time, but also as a chance to find your own way to make sense of this time. And there's some issues about Thanksgiving a lot of us have. And so we'll have some time to talk about that, unpack it, see if there's anything worth redeeming or not. But it'll be a good conversation, I think. Also want to mention that I am doing, trying on an experimental basis, at least through the end of this year, I'm doing office hours. And so for folks in the community who want to chat, visit, talk about what's happening in the in peace and justice organizing, who want to some personal counsel, discussion, whatever, I'll be from 12 to 2 p.m. on Thursdays, I'll be at different coffee shops around the city. So I'll be posting which one on Facebook, but uh, I think for this week, I'll be at All About Ya, which is the Korean coffee shop kind of thing that's over, it's just a little bit north of Memorial Road on May, just across streets from Barnes and Noble. Really cool place, very chill, but come on over, we'd love to visit with you. And again, I'll be there from 12 to 2 p.m. this Thursday. And then in future weeks, if you want me to come to your part of town, you know, a really cool coffee shop, um, anything, um, I'm up for it. So 12 to 2 p.m. on Thursdays. And then also, Jeff, I wanted you, maybe you could share just a little bit about, um, about the Objector Church, how folks can get connected, how they can support it, how they can join it. Uh, you know, we have a few minutes here, but could you share a little bit about that? Sure. I would hope that people would check out the website, objector.church. I would uh, hope that they uh, join our Facebook uh, community uh, at objector.church uh, on Facebook and join us on these weekly meetings. Um, so the Objector Church, it serves as a fiscal sponsor for Courage to Resist. The, I'm a project director of Courage to Resist, so I think that's very important. But the, the church... I'm also involved in a project with the church to establish a, a national uh, objector registry. And the point of the registry is that, you know, the law is, and people, it's easy to forget, but the law is that every young man, um, 18 to 25, I believe, has to sign up for the selective service with, with possible penalties that are very severe. Uh, we're talking tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars and possible prison time. Uh, of course, none of that happens, but there are other uh, penalties. Uh, mainly you lose uh, some federal benefits and many states you lose state benefits. And those, if, so if you don't sign up, you can lose those benefits for the rest of your life. Um, so it's significant. We believe that, uh, you know, there's the traditional peace churches, uh, the Mennonites, uh, the Quakers, and uh, James, you know much more about them than I do, but not everybody is lucky enough uh, to come from one of those communities. So the Objector Church, I hope, I believe, can serve as a, a religious center, uh, interfaith, and for those uh, that are agnostic or even less than agnostic, um, to be part of a, a peace and justice community, uh, to have this documented uh, participation and have this documented questioning of war and uh, violence and uh, solving nation state problems through that method. So uh, we would have this registry and then uh, if people feel compelled to so sign up for the selective service, as many people do, uh, in the in the case that in the future that they're uh, called up, they can point to this documentation and also being a, a member of this church as one uh, basis to uh, declare their objection to war and and assert their religious liberties uh, in America uh, today to uh, opt out of mandatory military service if it comes to that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have we have people asserting religious liberties left and right, to the, and then the courts are very happy to appease them. Sometimes people who don't want to bake a cake uh, for uh, for somebody uh, because they don't believe in their sexual orientation and stuff like that. 
well, then, you know, us uh, Americans uh, shouldn't have to uh, murder <laughs> other people around the world uh, based on our religious freedoms to avoid uh, being murderers, I guess I would say. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Uh, sorry, Mike. Okay, there we go. Uh, by the way, I just want to welcome a few people that have joined us. Of course, we have Cheryl, uh, Cheryl and Serena, but also Dan from the Bay Area has joined us. So I want to thank you. And he's he's all thank you. He is, and we have the others on Facebook. Um, one of the things I want to mention, if you want to get involved with the church, and we're still at the very early stages of things, but if you would like to get involved, to stay connected, uh, or just financially support us, our website's objector.church, and there's information there. That you can sign up as a member of the church, you can sign up as a supporter, but that funding is really critical for us to do the work we need to do. And uh, we're hoping in time, though, to be building not just an online presence, but in-person communities. Uh, uh, in the Bay Area and Oklahoma City, those are our two places right now, but in time we're hoping to expand so that there'll be a whole network of communities, and particularly some places where that these can be bases for peace activism, for work for social justice, but they can also be places that young people can go to and they're struggling with issues of conscience. And finally, for people of a wide variety of religious and philosophical perspectives, a lot of people crave ritual. They're craving things, life cycle ritual, having a meaningful wedding, a meaning, meaningful funeral for a loved one, but something that reflects what they're about, not what some church or some other institution says it should be about. So our ministers, one of the things we're, we're doing and training to do more of is to be equipped to help people to be innovative, creative, and to collaborate with them in creating rituals that are meaningful to them. Whether you believe in God or not, doesn't matter. For us, we think there's value in all human beings finding a path for them. Like that's why today for my background, I chose this coexist flag just as a way of expressing all the wide variety of how of human beings and how that we seek meaning. So anyway, so that's kind of the main things I want to share today on the information side of things. Um, do want to welcome everyone who has joined and we'd love more comments. And after the fact, we're going to have this in archived form uh, on Facebook for sure over not before too long, we're going to have this set up as an audio podcast. And so once that's up, please share this. We're gonna have lots of ways for people to interact with, and particularly for any of you who like, who watch this, who like what you're hearing, please let your friends know. That's the only way this is gonna take off. We really need, need it to get out there. So I encourage you to do that. And um, lastly, just thank everyone who participated today. Um, it really means a lot to us. So if there's any other questions, comments, or whatever, feel free to post them on Zoom or Facebook, and we'll be on for a minute or so. And then after that, we will wrap it up for today. And um, also for next week, it'll be the same time. Uh, we'll have it on Zoom, but also do the simulcasting to Facebook Live. Um, so same time, and we'll be doing this every Tuesday, same, uh, same time. Yeah. So James. Yes. Uh, you know, people might ask, you know, you guys are a new church. What are you doing? And you're asking for money uh, kind of thing. But I would want to, I would want to just say, Part of what we're fundraising for, like maybe the majority of what we're fundraising for, um, is to support, <laughs> well, is to support you, <laughs> James yeah. Branham, as a minister. Um, and you said a lot of great things about people are looking uh, for uh, ritual and whatnot. People are also looking uh, for community, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes, uh, you can be within uh, a big city like I am and still feel like you're isolated. Or you could be out where, like where from I grew up with. Maybe you uh, grew up with a particular uh, church community, but they no longer reflect uh, your peace and justice values, mm -hmm. uh, your objection to war and, and militarism. Well, you know, you don't have to leave that community. But you could you know, hopefully you could join us on these weekly discussions and bring some of, of these thoughts uh, back to that community. Uh, mm -hmm. So, again, you know, we're hoping that people do donate. Uh, we're a church, of course, so it's tax deductible. Um, but um, donate so we could 
uh, keep uh, you, <laughs> James mm -hmm. Brana, uh, doing these weekly uh, podcasts so you can have your office hours there in Oklahoma City. And also so you can maybe do uh, more uh, traveling events because we really did appreciate you uh, being able to come out here to, to Oakland, California last week. So that's my pitch uh, to uh, donate to the Objector Church. Also, I'll also mention for our hope in time, too, is that we can be a place for service members themselves that are struggling with issues of conscience, that are asking questions, have a place to connect. Um, a lot of times, I think for many people, you know, in the military, chaplains, and if any of you who are in the military have been in before, you know the chaplains often are not so helpful. They often are going to be the ones who are basically tell you that whatever you're being told to do is good and tell you kind of be there to absolve your conscience. Well, we want to be, in a sense, our ministers to be a different kind of chaplain, not about the mission of the military, but about the mission of peace, about the mission of social justice. And so for folks in the military, we want to be there to provide them someone to talk to, make sense of things, and to help them as they work through, through a lot of things. And part of it, too, our work with Courage to Resist, we have the legal side of it, but from the church side of it, we want to be there more for the emotional, spiritual, all those other things that may not necessarily fit under the rubric of legal help, but are still really important. Um, one of the things I think about, Jeff, in your story was the fact of how isolated you were through so much of that, particularly when the, that big showdown was happening. Um, we want folks to not have to face those things by themselves as much as possible to be equipped, to be a strength. So there's a lot of things that we want to do. And so... Anyway, that's enough of the pitch for today. I really appreciate everyone who, who's watching, and uh, again, share it with your friends.